Ephesians 5, I've expanded the lesson here, uh, and that's what, that's what had me uh, so joyful this afternoon, just thinking about how great uh, God's creation is. It, it, it amazes me uh, that when you, when you really start to think about it and you start to ponder all, the, all of the creation and how fearfully and wonderfully it is all made, you just don't believe in evolution. You can't believe in evolution. There's no allowance for that much change over, I don't care how many millions of years they said it took place, you just cannot improve upon a species uh, in, in the, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, the intricate design of different species of animals and plants and how they do things. It's like, um, what did I see? There's a, what was it? A tree or a bush or something like that. I'll have to go back and look at some notes I made that um, forms some of its leaves to look like a snake to keep certain species of like invasive bugs off of it and you have to ask the question how did a tree learn what a snake looked like they don't have eyes they don't have ears they don't they can't feel what a snake is how did they how did that happen and then you have a snake I saw this last week, a snake that lives in these rocky cliffs and number one, the, the design of its scales looks just like the rocks that it lives on. So it hides itself well and then the tail of that snake looks just like, uh, what was it, like a spider. A big spider and it sticks its tail out and makes motions with its tail that look like a spider is moving around and it does that to attract a certain type of bird that it eats when the bird flies over to the cliff to get the spider that it eats the snake head comes out and grabs the bird and wraps it up and swallows it and I'm going how did the snake make its tail look like a spider that this bird that it likes to eat come? How did it, how did it do that? How did the snake learn that this type of bird likes to eat this kind of spider? How did it learn that? I don't know. There is no answer to that. So you can't tell me that that happened because of evolution. No way, no how. And then there's a bird. This will flip your mind. A bird that builds a nest that looks like a, a big gourd hanging from a tree. You know, like these pear-looking gourds. that's a little kind of skinny at the top and it's big rounded at the bottom. Guess what? It's got a secret trap door built into the nest. The bird when it goes into the hole there, it knows, because it built the nest, it knows where the trap door is, and it goes into that trap door to a different chamber in the nest. Any kind of, of um, well, like a, maybe another snake or another kind of larger bird or whatever, that would want to get into that nest doesn't know where that trap door is and it goes into an it may watch the bird fly into that nest but when it goes into it it ends up in this empty chamber that was specifically designed to fool predators so if a, some kind of large you know furry animal that climbs trees can get down into that nest to go after that bird it won't find the bird and it may watch it go into it, it'll go in the wrong place and go, where's the bird? 
But the bird's sitting behind a division there in its own secret chamber that it built into that nest. And I'm going, no, that's not evolution. That is a God who designed that so that we would go, wow. Not that we would go, yeah, I wonder how many millions of years it took that to happen. Makes me mad. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. We're going to learn something tonight. Uh, verse 22. Wives. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Uh, and, you know, in the times that we live in, I will address this. Um, those who practice sodomite marriage, they will never, ever, ever find in that marriage the blessing that God gives to a man and a wife because they are not following God's plan for that marriage. That marriage is to have a husband and is to have a wife. And I don't care how effeminate acting some man is or how male acting some woman is, they will never ever attain to the happiness that is gained by two by a couple of man and woman together receiving God's blessing on them because how can a wife submit to a wife? Or how can a husband submit to another husband? They can't. That it, it, it has defiled God's plan and not just the defilement part, they, will re they receive no blessing from God. And I don't care how many ministers perform their weddings they will never, ever attain to the satisfaction and joy that God gives to even lost peoples, a husband and a wife. They will never attain to that. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as, the Christ, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, some things in nature, in, in human nature, uh, that will display exactly why God is saying it this way, why God has it this way, and actually there is a, a great role that the wife plays in the life of her husband, and that role was ordained by God from the creation. For when God created man, he created him a certain way, and you'll understand where I'm going with this in a minute. But let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word, and I thank you, God, for uh, showing us great and mighty things. Lord, this is the age of science and technology, and we, we know things now that our forefathers didn't know, things like DNA, things about blood, uh, things about the human body, and things about what ha happens in nature. Father, our forefathers didn't know these things, we know them now, and when we look at the scriptures, we see exactly that your handiwork was in all of the creation. And truly, there isn't anything made that was made that wasn't made by Jesus Christ. It was all made by him, and you have your signature on everything in your creation. Father, we just we look forward to learning more and more things as we move along through life. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. And amen. Now, uh, I don't think I've brought this part of it up, but um, to understand the relationship, we'll look at two aspects of nature. Number one, the, how God created us humans. We have, uh, with the Bible tells us that we are made a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. Those three are, match the design of our Creator, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Um, and so that's what Paul was talking about in Romans 1 uh, when he said that uh, the hidden things of God can be seen uh, because he's put it in his creation. You can see even his eternal power and Godhead 
Well, the Godhead refers to what we call the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I mentioned how the creation follows uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, time, God created the heaven, that space, and the earth, that's matter. The three aspects of creation, time, space, and matter, are they point to the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, so does the human being. We are not made without a soul. We are made with a soul, and we have a spirit. And it's spirit, soul, and body. And so um, one day I, re I remember reading this verse, and it just jumped out at me. I know I've read Psalm 34 several times before that, but it didn't really click. But my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. That convinced me, and it made sense now, when, when we look at this thing of Christ and the church being together, the church is characterized as a woman, and Christ is always a male, and so he joins with his wife. Well, it makes sense that our soul then is a female. Every human soul is characterized as a woman, as a female. So when you think about that, Christ is not joining with our physical body. That's corrupt. It's full of sin. It's full of corruption. And it's going to die off and rot in the ground. And then God's going to burn it all up at the end of time. But our soul survives the death of the body. And the soul then, let's say that, let's say that a person is lost. And their soul does not delight in the things of the Lord. Where is that soul going to spend eternity? The lake of fire. God's going to create a new body for it. Boom. It's going to burn forever. And it's never, ever, ever going to stop. Um, but then what if the soul, what if your soul, Pam, decided that it didn't like the decisions that your flesh was making? And your soul said, you know what? I want to follow God. Well, so now you're stuck with this flesh body, but your soul delights in the Lord. So your soul is going to part ways with your physical body when that body dies. And your soul is going to be regenerated. It's going to have a new body. And it's going to be part of the body of Jesus Christ. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, which makes all of this make better sense now to me. Now I understand it better. And we talked about this before God called their name Adam. And um, that's just how it was designed to be. That's why, uh, what was your maiden name? Anderson. Pam, Pamela Anderson. Yeah, yeah. Pamela Anderson. Um, yeah. Didn't know that about you. Um, but anyway, um, so when you married Keith, you took his Last name, that's why, that's why it comes from the Bible. God called their name, that's Mr. and Mrs. Adam. Or if you translate the word Adam, Mr. and Mrs. Dirt. Because that's, that's literally what it means. Adam or Edom means red, and it's after the color of dirt. Okay, red clay. Anyway, God called their name Adam in the day that they were created. Now, um... Let me do this. Uh, Colossians 3.17 is a double witness. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. So there's a double witness there uh, from the scriptures. And in 1 Peter... Um, 1 Peter chapter 3 starts out dealing with the wives, saying that the wife can actually lead the husband. In fact, let's read that very quickly. We get the context as we move down toward verse 7. Uh, but in 1 Peter 3, Likewise, you wives, be in subject to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That's exactly how it worked with my dad. I mean, exactly how it did. Uh, my mother is responsible for where my dad is right now. And um, 
it was, it was the conversation of my mother that finally broke through to my dad and he started going to church with her and, um, and he's in heaven. So while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of hair, wearing of gold, or putting on apparel, let it be the hidden man. Look at that. How can a woman now be a man? She's got that new man on the inside of her. It's like Sarah. Sarah had a new man in her. And it was, it was Isaac. Uh, he was a child of promise. Um, Let's look down in verse 7 now where I'm going with this. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, the, and underline that or just mark that in your mind that God did not design man and woman to be the same. He designed them to be different, but for a reason. It's not that God sees women as anything less than men, but God did design their nature to be weaker. I, I'll never forget when Brother Kelly came and he preached this here several years ago. It's about the first time I had him preach here. And he said something I never thought of before, but it makes sense. He said, God designed the man to bear a lot of pressure but he couldn't handle pain very well don't ask us to go get a shot we won't do it but the woman every year when the flu shot comes out yep go, go, go line up go and get a flu shot and men will go i don't need one i don't need one okay because we don't want the needle we can fight wars chris but don't come at us with a needle Okay, but God designed the woman to handle a lot of pain, i.e. childbirth, but not a lot of pressure. And I went, wow. So, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together, look at this. God looked at the man and said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him help meet for him. God designed it that the man and woman should be heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers uh, be not hindered. And so it just works better when the husband and wife agree together as to following the Lord and um, they are heirs together of God's grace together one cannot do it without the other is sort of how it's saying here now that doesn't mean that uh if a woman has a lost husband and he's never converted does that mean the woman goes to hell no um because god uh christ saves their soul in first timothy chapter 2 verse 12 uh, but i suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. God did it that way for a reason. And again, we go back to why was Eve created? It is not good that the man should be alone. And so God had a purpose in the creation of the woman and, and how he brought her to him and for what reason. Does, does Adam need this wife? Why does he need this? Um, and God is so intent on this that he designed it so that the office of a bishop should not be taken by uh, a man with, who does not have a wife. And I never really thought about that uh, until I finally gave thought to it. And I said, you know what? God's right here. Um, a man who... It's like the Catholic priesthood. The priesthood is in serious trouble because most priests nowadays end up being closet sodomites. You can say what you want to, but it's because the Catholic Church enforces this issue of celibacy on those men. And in the different documentaries that I had watched 
what I was doing research into this issue of these pedophile priests and why they were going after these children, uh, when the subject came up, when people in, in the Vatican were being interviewed, Vatican officials, you know, with all this trouble with, you have these priests that are praying not just upon children, but upon women, upon men. Uh, there was a scandal a couple of years ago in the Vatican, high-ranking Vatican officials. They were all busted in a raid that Roman officials uh, heard of these sodomite parties that were going on when they raided these things because they knew prostitution was going on. When they raided these places, they found a bunch of high-ranking Catholic priests in these parties. I won't go beyond that word, but you know what I'm saying. There was these parties going on with these sodomite prostitutes, and the men that were there were high-ranking Catholic priests in the Vatican. Big, big scandal that took place. And it's very common among the Catholic priesthood that these men turn out to be sodomites and they prey upon other men or they prey upon children. Um, where was I going with all that? Um, I can't think of it now. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll probably catch it in a little bit. But basically, when the Vatican was asked, why don't you let these priests be married? Was the question. And over and over, these Catholic officials were saying, listen, our priests are telling us that celibacy to them is a blessing. And they look forward to making their vows of celibacy and living that chaste life. Well, the truth of it is they don't. They don't live chaste. They don't, they don't enjoy celibacy. That's what's causing them to go out and corrupt celibacy because none of them are being chased, including the very Catholic officials that come out and say, hey, we, we enjoy this. We like it. It's fun. No, it's not. It's a defilement. It's not God's way. So God designed that the bishop should be the husband of one wife. He needs that wife to keep himself clean, to keep himself away from the world, and he needs that woman to be at his side for the advice that she gives him, and that's where I'm going with this. Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So the devil knew which one to go to because she was the weaker vessel. But why? Now, take a look at this. I've taught this before. But to me, this, this brings it, um, this makes a lot of sense. This is your brain, okay? And the left side of your brain deals primarily with logic. Things are yes and no, black and white, up is up, down is down, left is left, right is right. Um, when someone asks you a question and you're going to tell them a truthful answer, it's the left brain that will look for the answers. It will go through files of memory banks and try to pull out the right answer so you can read it off to them. And lawyers know this. Uh, if you've ever been in a deposition, I was in a car wreck one time, a guy hit me, I was in a funeral procession, he had the light but the question is, the funeral procession has the right of way, but he had the light in the intersection. So who's at fault? He T-boned me. We literally met like this. So who, who was at fault? Huh? You know what the lawyers said? Both lawyers, my lawyer and his lawyer said, you're both at fault. And if you go to court, that's what, that's what the jury is going to see. Is that, and so he gave, I was in the deposition, his lawyer was firing off all these questions to me, and after a while he would double back and say, now, I asked you a question earlier, can you give me that answer again? And when I gave the same exact answer, um, my lawyer came out and said, you did a good job. 
but so did the other guy. Because we were both telling the truth. And we were telling things that we knew so that we didn't have to come up with some other answer. I'm going to need some sugar from somebody. I, my blood sugar is about to drop. So if you've got some, what do you got there? Huh? Now and laters. Let me get an almond joy here. What else is in here? Here we go, some Laffy Taffy. Um, but the, your right brain doesn't see the world that way. Your right brain is where the artistic side who can draw or who can paint? I know Callie can, okay? Or music. Music is composed in the right brain, okay? Because it's created. And your right brain deals with creation, invention. And all of that comes from imagining things. And your imagination primarily is your right brain. However, if you're going to answer a question and you're going to lie about it, which side of the brain can concoct a lie? The right side. Because what you do is you draw a picture. You actually, you make a movie. You create a film in your mind and a scenario that you tell to somebody. The problem is... You have a hard time rewinding the film and planning it back exactly the way that you just told it before. So when you're questioned and asked to repeat your answer, they know that if you lied about something, that you're going to have a very difficult time remembering the scenario that you drew earlier because it passes away quickly. Okay? Um... Go in my office and get me some more of them almond joys. I got them in a bag there. I bought more candy. There's a candy store on Interstate 44 called Redmond's. And we always, did you guys stop there? Oh! We always stop there and buy the kids a whole bunch of candy because they sell it by the pound. Huh? I, I can't hear you, so. Anyway, um, but the right brain is what feeds the left brain when you're reading your Bible. Oh, thank you very much. That's good. That's good. So, turn to, um, turn to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. I'll show you how this works. This is the famous story of David and Goliath. Now, as I just said that, I want you to picture Goliath, okay? Everybody got a picture of Goliath? What's he look like? Okay. When you're reading, let's see here, verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. That's pretty heavy. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs for protection and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants of Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and servants. Now, as we were just reading that, 
your left brain was looking at all those funny ink lines on the paper. Over time, we learned that those lines are letters. And we also learned that those letters put together make words, and those words are syntaxed by our left brain. They're what makes sense. They're why we put, in English, we put a noun first, and then a verb. So, John saw Melissa. And so, Melissa is the object of the verb. And we have descriptive nouns, adjectives. We have descriptive verbs called, what are they, adverbs? Like happily, uh, sadly, so on. All of those convey meaning to us, but only in a logical way. While we're reading this, and our left brain is decoding all of the funny characters on the page into proper English that we understand, our right brain is helping us understand it by drawing us a picture. Now, I'm sure that everybody's picture of Goliath is probably different. Somehow, some way. You ever, if you've ever read a book, and then they made a movie about it, and you watch the movie and you're going, no, no, they got it all wrong. Why did they do that? Okay? Like, uh, I don't know, I read The Da Vinci Code, and then they made a movie about it, and I'm going, well, that's not how I had it. Everybody's imagination is what? Different which is the reason why we're not to rely upon imagination alone. Does that make sense? Because your picture of Goliath may be different than my picture of Goliath. So that forces us to go back to reading the text. The text is giving us a description here of Goliath, so we're adding these pieces as we're reading it, and that's our right brain doing that. Okay, um, let me read these words here. Detail-oriented on the left brain, uh, logical, sequential, rational, math and science, can comprehend things, analytical, objective, uses logic, facts, rule, words, and language, present and past, knowing. See, present and past have to be logical because they rely upon facts that happen. What happens when we try to see the future? What side of the brain sees the future? The right. Because we can't rely upon logic and facts because we don't have them yet. We have to draw an imaginary picture of the future. Which why, is why when you read prophecy of things before they happen, when they actually happen, it doesn't sometimes match up to how we thought it was going to happen, does it? Okay? As my sugar climbs, this will make more sense. Thank God for almond joy because sometimes you feel like a nut. <laughs> Knowing, acknowledgement, object, object names. Top, left brain. Um, Reality-based, form strategies, mathematics, order pattern perception, practical, things that are planned, safe, cautious. Like standing on a 10-story ledge, your left brain tells you, don't take another step, you'll fall. When I worked in construction, a lot of times, people would build a house and they had this big foyer, a two-story foyer in their house, and I hated those. Because if they got painted by hand, I was gonna be the guy that was gonna set a ladder up and put a two by 10, stretching from the landing to the ladder. And I'm going sideways like this on that board with a bucket of paint and a big eight inch block brush in my hand and you bend down and then I would get stuck right there because I would, I would be telling myself, Mike, 
if you lean a half an inch forward, you're going to fall. And I would literally be frozen there until I figured out some way of trying to raise up without falling and losing my balance, okay? That's my logic, my left brain saying, you don't want to fall. That's bad, okay? But the right brain gets a look at the big picture. How do we do that? We have to imagine it, because we can't see everything all at once. It looks at holes. It's, it's random. Intuitive. That's a very important word. I got a hold of, somebody sent me some CDs of a conference that went on in a Nazarene church several years ago. And the whole conference was teaching people how to perceive God by intuition rather than reading it from the Word of God. They would even pray, Lord, help us to intuit your presence and intuit your voice. So, David C. Cook came out years ago with a vac vacation Bible school program, and it was, I forgot what it was about, the theme, but they were talking about the Israelites going from Egypt to the Promised Land. And it said when they got to Mount Sinai, they drew like a picture of the Red Sea, and they wanted you, the student, to draw a picture of the Israelites, however you could, stick figures or whatever. And then the, the, the material said, close your eyes and imagine God building a bridge across the Red Sea so that the Israelites can cross and be with God. As soon as I read that, I went, why would they do that when they can simply read Exodus and find out that God didn't build a bridge? He parted the sea so that they could cross. That's how God did it. But they were wanting these young people, they were training these young people to use their right brain to alter God's word. And any alteration in God's word will always come Right brain. Now, um, the right brain deals with philosophy and spiritualism. Synthesizing things. Subjective. Uses feeling. Imagination. Rules. Symbols and images. Okay? Uh, present and future. The right brain believes. It appreciates. It knows object function. Fantasy based. Presents possibilities. It deals with spatial perception. And you're aware of what room you're in. Um, spontaneous decisions come from the right brain. Adventurous decisions come from the right brain. Carefree and risk-taking decisions all come from the right brain because you tell yourself, you know what, I think I can. I think I can jump across this without falling down and plunging 100 feet to my death. I think I can do that. Remember back in the days uh, during Vietnam, Chris, when guys were doing LSD? They were doing acid? That LSD shut down the logic centers of their brain. Which is why you had these hippies on top of buildings jumping off because they were so high, their right brain told them they could fly. And they would see all kinds of illusions, visions. They would have all of these things. Now they're doing ayahuasca down in South America, which is far worse. They can go down there and legally... Take these trips and see devils and contact them. Now get this. The devils contact them because the logic part of their brain is shut down and their visionary part of their brain, their imagination brain, is wide open. And that's how the devils speak to us. They go here. Not here, because this side of the brain will shut them down and say, no, that's against God's law. The right brain says, you know what? I've always wanted to try that. Right? So, here's a different picture of it, the same idea. If we were to assign genders to the halves of the brain, what gender would the left brain 
B. Male. Men do not design the decorations in the house. Exactly. Look at Mama Michael's shirt back there. Mama Michael, show me your shirt. Stand up and show everybody your shirt. That's a pretty shirt. Yeah, okay. It's pretty colors, isn't it? I'm not ever going to wear that shirt. I believe that. Yeah. When you were on acid back then, of course. Yeah. Okay, uh, look at Chris and Helen's shirts. Look at the difference. His is straight stripes. Hers, or his is straight stripes. Hers is flowers, right? Happy flowers. See? That's the right brain. The, the right brain is the female. The left brain is the male. So watch this. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. There's actually an, a part of my brain right in the middle called the corpus callosum. And it, it means like the big body or something like that. But it actually is the conduit by which the right brain can communicate with the left brain and the left brain can communicate with the right brain. They're speaking back and forth to each other constantly. But of these two hemispheres of your brain, which one in your daily activities has to be in charge at all times? Left brain. The left brain drives the car to church and it drives it under the speed limit or at the speed limit and it stops at all the stop signs and red lights and it uses caution, and it turns the signal on, and so on. But the right brain says, honey, you're going the wrong way. You missed the turn. <laughs> you missed the turn. I didn't either. Yeah, you did. You missed the turn. I'm telling you, I've, I've been this way before. I remember it, okay? So now, when the devil decided to go to the couple that God made, the man and his wife, who did he go to? Eve. Why? Because he knew that he didn't have to say much to her. And everything that she did, let's look at that. Everything that went through Eve's mind was right brain activity. Every bit of it. She imagined what eating this fruit would be like. Look at verse 6. When the women saw that the tree was good for food, how did she know? She had never tasted it. You know what she did? She imagined by its appearance that it would taste good. Lust of the flesh. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. What side of the brain? Right brain. Oh, that looks pretty, happy, joyful. Those are all right brain activities. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. She had to predict the future of what she thought this fruit would do for her if she ate it. She had to predict the future. She drew a picture of what her life and her mind would be like if she ate this fruit. Every bit of what she went through was right brain activity. None of it was based on actual fact, was it? None of it was. And so, when we look at the Bible and look at the word imagination, your imagination is always right brain. God saw that the wickedness of the man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, which means that the right brain was constantly telling the left brain, uh, you can get away with violating God's word. You can go against God. You don't have to follow God. You can do whatever you want to. It was constantly evil. So that when men and women decided to do things, they were always going to do the wrong things because of the imagination. Jezebel is on the right side, and she makes the wrong decisions. 
Genesis 11, Tower of Babel. Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. What do we know about science fiction? Science fiction feeds science. It takes the Ray Bradbury's and the Isaac Asimov's and all of the science fiction writers and the Gene Roddenberry's and the George Lucas's of the world. It takes those men to imagine what science would be like and what technology would be like 300, 400 years into the future or in a galaxy far, far away. And lo and behold now, we now have the communicators. We have, we have the diagnostic tools that you hold in your hand we are, we are developing those things right now. But they all came from the imagination. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Look at Psalm 38, 12. In fact, open your Bible up to this. Because if I, when I tell you that lies are always designed in the right brain, this verse says it in no uncertain terms. When you lie, you have to draw a picture of what that lie, what did you want it to look like. It's not based on fact, it's based on imagination. So Psalm 38, 12, they also that seek after my life lay snares for me, and they that seek my hurt speak mischievous things and imagine deceit all the day long. Lies come from the imagination. You make them up. They are make-believe stories that we tell, all from the right brain. And uh, Proverbs 6, these six things does the Lord hate, and one of them, verse 18, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Uh, Jeremiah 7, but they hearken not, nor incline their ear, but walked in the councils and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Romans 1, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into a what? Image. An image of um, made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. What I've learned is the reason why God hates idols so much is that the features of those idols <clears throat> are all based on imagination. And, and the 21st century version of that is when people in their mind carve out a God that does not match the description of God and His ways that are in the Bible. And that is where a lot of your denominations are headed. A lot of churches are headed. Uh, I, I would say nowadays, if you're going to have a church of a thousand people or more, you're going to have to not tell them the truth. Plain and simple. Because most Americans in this country do not want the truth of the Scriptures. They don't want it. They carve out an image of God that allows them to sin all they want to. Allows them to live in sin, keep their sin, have no substantive change in their life whatsoever. And that's how they die. So, 2 Corinthians 10, casting down imagination. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the Bible's plain here. Cast down imagination. When you imagine that God is somehow different than how he's portrayed in the Bible, you have an imagination that is exalting itself against your knowledge of what the Word of God says. Anything, any lie that you tell about God comes from imagination. Any lie that you tell about the Bible comes from imagination. Um, and those things need to be... Let me ask you a question. How was Jezebel killed? 
How did Jezebel die? The Jezebel in the Bible. Does anybody know? Huh? She didn't fall. She was cast down. And remember, remember, Jezebel is the right brain. Ahab was left brain. When Naboth told Ahab, I cannot sell you my vineyard, Ahab accepted that as a fact. He knew the law. What did Jezebel say? I'll get you his vineyard. She concocted a plan that had cast Naboth as a heretic, that he blasphemed God, had him killed, and now Ahab has the vineyard. But it was done by her. So what was her judgment? Jehu comes riding into town, and he calls to these eunuchs. There was three or four of them. Okay? The knowledge that you get from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the knowledge of the gospel, how man is really saved. So they took her and they cast her down. That's casting down imaginations because she exalted herself above the knowledge of God. Okay? Um, I had another illustration of that too in the Bible. I just, I just came in and left. Quickly. But anyway, um, this, this, is, this is how God designed everything. Again, I can't read my Bible without my imagination helping me to see the stories, helping me to see in my mind's, we call it our mind's eye. It's our mind's eye that draws these pictures for us of what it is that we're reading. Okay? The problem is you don't want the imaginative part of your mind taking over the logic part of what you just read. You stick with what the Bible says, the letter of the law. You stick with that, and it's, and it's the, the right brain that is helping the left brain understand it, give it meaning, give it comprehension. Uh, and as far as intuition is concerned, my wife has said several times, to me about certain people that we've met. You need to watch out for them. And I used to go, well, I need facts. I can't rely on feelings. And I found out she was right. There was something that God was only going to let her in on. That's how the Holy Spirit worked. God was going to move in my wife to come to me and say, Psst, you need to watch out for that. Okay? Um, an illustration of that, I have in my notes, we don't have time for it, um, but it has to do with Esther. Esther is right brain, King Ahasuerus is left brain, and as far as he is concerned, he has an enemy among his people, and it's the Jews, and Haman is going to take care of the Jewish question. Okay? Call it the final solution, because that's what um, Adolf Eichmann called it when he decided to have all the Jews transported and gassed in these concentration camps. Haman was Adolf Eichmann. And as far as King Ahasuerus was concerned, he was fed the wrong... He was fed a lie. He was told that the Jews are contrary to his kingdom and would, would have him deposed. That was a lie. That was uh, Haman. That was the evil guy. But when Esther, the right brain, came to him and helped him understand, uh, you need to know that your wife is one of those Jewish people, and Mordecai, who you are exalting, is also a Jew, and when Haman starts killing people, do you think they're going to spare me? No. And you know what she did? She helped Ahasuerus make the right decision and having Haman hung on his own gallows. Haman and his family hung on his own gallows so that he could spare the Jews. Okay? So, ladies, wives, you have a very important 
place in the role not only of your family, but in the role of the church, okay? When we have uh, board meetings, um, I can tell you from experience, cause, and I've read, I've read the, uh, the notes on various board meetings that happened while I was a young man, and we had a church split here, and I saw what was going on, and I saw who was the ringleaders of it, and they were women. There was women on the board back then, and they were the troublemakers that were going to try to throw this pastor out while his back was turned. They had meetings. They sent him off to the national meeting, thousand miles away, and then they had meetings behind his back on how they could get rid of him and how they could do it so that when he got back, they could just tell him, look, we fired you while you were gone. And, um, and I know the women that was, that was part of that. I knew them, and it didn't surprise me when I found that out. And uh, there is nothing, uh, the ladies met today, and you guys did what? Worked out homecoming, okay? That's perfectly right and proper. Uh, and even when it comes to these important decisions that the men make for the church, the input from our wives is precious and valuable. We need it. Um, I don't tell my wife anymore, shh, 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 hush, let me think. I listen to what she says, because there's some things there that I probably need to hear that God told her, and God's going to use her to lead and guide me. All right, let's stand to our feet.